Um, for our viewing audience, uh, welcome. Uh, to, my name is Ben Berto. I'm the Director of Planning and Building and Services. Uh, we are conducting this as a virtual meeting as we have been doing since the beginning of this uh, coronavirus crisis. Um, and we uh, welcome everybody to log on and listen. Um, what you're seeing on your screen right now and presumably also being broadcast via Marin TV uh, in the town website um, are links to join the meeting, um, both something you could type in or uh, if you're more comfortable using your phone, uh, you can phone in on that number uh, in order to access this meeting and participate during the public participation times. Uh, you will need to enter the meeting ID number when prompted. So those of you who have been in several uh, Zoom meetings kind of know the drill. Um, if you run into some difficulty, persevere, please. Um, and also, if you are watching this and for some reason uh, will not have the ability to participate directly with this meeting, um, please feel free to email me at some point. Um, you'll see that on the uh, in materials surrounding the meeting. It's bberto at townoffairfax.org. Um, and so that's it for the public participation. As I said, if you phone in, there are at least two, there are two points in the meeting where we will be taking live phone calls. Um, and we do want to hear from you if you have any questions or comments. Uh, so welcome again. And uh, this is just the usual uh, uh, information. Uh, as, as always, we invite the public to participate, um, but we also encourage respectful behavior. Uh, we want to hear from everybody. Uh, and so we are uh, limiting people to three minutes of conversation. Uh, if there are, if there is time, we may consider continue to uh, come call back in. Um, we do ask that the audience uh, refrain from any profane language or ridiculing the character of any commission member, staff, or members of the public. So we thank you for participating, and I know you'll you'll do a great job. In terms of introductions uh, and some very brief background. Uh, the town of Fairfax, uh, in cooperation with the County of Marin and nine other jurisdictions, so 10, 11 jurisdictions total, um, has been working on uh, putting together objective design and development standards. Um, they, the team that is uh, working with us tonight, the design team, is Opticos uh, and Plan in Place, or Plan to Place, rather, um, with uh, Stefan Pellegrini. Uh, and David, uh, Dave Javid, uh, helping assist and run this meeting. In so far as I'm looking at, uh, in terms of calling this meeting to order, uh, Michelle Rodriguez is the acting planning commission chair. Um, at this time, we do not have a quorum of members. Um, we have two commissioners uh, participating at this time, uh, Michelle Rodriguez and Three. Sir Gonzalez Barber. I think there's three. Cindy Swift. Cindy Swift. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, Cindy, you're off my screen. That's correct. <laughs> um, we still lack a quorum. However, insofar as this is being uh, conducted as a workshop, um, we can proceed ahead. Michelle, do you have a copy of our agenda in front of you? I'm waiting to hear from Michelle. Michelle, I think you might still be. I do not. Okay. Well, it's basically, it's a very simple approval of the agenda and affidavit of posting. And I will uh, note that this has been posted in th the typical three locations around town, um, at Town Hall, uh, the post office, and at the Women's Club. Uh, so that's been addressed. Um, and with that, I will turn the meeting over to uh, Opticos. Um, Great. Thank you so yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Dave Javid again here from Plan to Place. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how the public discussion and planning commission discussion is going to be facilitated. Um, as Ben mentioned, we're going to have points throughout the presentation, two points in particular after we go over the background, and then again after we go over th some of the analyses um, to provide a platform to have a discussion uh, both with planning commissioners and with members of the public. Uh, for the planning commission, 
Uh, if you all could please use the raise your hand feature as pointed out here in this little graphic, it's at the bottom of your participant window. If you click that, that'll put a hand up on the screen um, on the participant window, which I'll see. And I'll go ahead and unmute your mic so that you can participate that way. Uh, and then after we've had that initial discussion for the members of the public, uh, we're also setting time um, to hear from you all. Thank you again for joining us. And as typical um, for these type of meetings, there'll be a three minute time limit. I'll actually have a little uh, timer on the screen to help identify that. And you will, each will also have the same opportunity. And also for you, same function is to go ahead and use that raise your hand function at the bottom of the participant window and that'll cue me up to let me know that you have a comment to make. And if you are calling in, as Ben mentioned earlier, you can also dial star nine on your phone and that will effectively do the same and it'll give me that, that cue um, that you're ready to provide a comment. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Stefan to start the meeting. Thank you, Dave. Um, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks uh, for taking the time to uh, be here with us um, this evening. Uh, my name is Stefan Pellegrini. I am principal at Opticos Design. Uh, we are an urban design architecture and planning firm uh, located in Berkeley, California. And on the line with me this evening is uh, Tony Perez. Uh, Tony Perez is our uh, senior associates and um, is participating in many projects uh, that are related to objective design standards. Um, uh, Dave Javid and Suhaila Sikand are also on the line from Plan to Place. Uh, they are um, also members of the project team. Um, and without us uh, tonight um, are uh, representatives of Lisa Wise Consulting um, who um, are also participating in the multi-jurisdictional project. So um, uh, as uh, Dave mentioned, this presentation is separated into two sections. Um, in the first section, I'm going to uh, touch on um, the um, first uh, four of the bullets that you see here on the agenda slide. And then we'll take a break for some questions and comments. And then I will follow up and do a second piece that um, provides a little bit more information about the project that we're working on today and a uh, case study that provides a good example of uh, objective design standards. So I'm gonna talk a little bit first about um, the project timeline and where we are, um, some information about objective design standards, uh, why they're needed um, and um, uh, and what they entail uh, before moving on to a more specific discussion of the Marin County project. Um, as Ben mentioned, we are working with the county and uh, 10 participating jurisdictions. We started this work um, in, uh, at the end of 2019, and we are about midway through the second phase of a three-phase project. Uh, in working clo very closely with um, the planning directors as principal representatives of, uh, of the different communities. Um, what we are working on is actually a series of template-based deliverables uh, that can then be uh, applied um, uh, through a more detailed discussion with individual jurisdictions and their stakeholders. Um, and we anticipate that that phase of the project be uh, beginning um, in, later this year um, in the fall. So a little bit of uh, additional information about objective design and development standards. Um, this is a, a term that many of you probably um, have begun to hear more frequently um, in the last few years, particularly as changes in state law have begun to request the presence of objective design standards, uh, particularly with regards to the review of uh, certain uh, kinds of housing projects. Um, but objective design and development standards are defined as standards that involve no personal or subjective judgment by a public official. And uh, this slide provides some examples of what we mean uh, when we use this term objective design standards. 
uh, these are three different examples of standards that are written uh, with um, little room for interpretation in mind. Uh, building height, any building with commercial uses on the ground floor of a ground floor have at least 14 feet measured from floor to ceiling, for example, um, or uh, particular standards that actually might guide the location and treatment of parking, as in the next one, uh, or uh, standards, for example, that actually might suggest um, uh, uh, how buildings can be massed and scaled, um, in, um, for example. And uh, what is uh, typical when we think about objective design standards is uh, the presentation of clear standards, but also accompanied by clear diagrams and imagery that can help to interpret those standards. So this is different from what many communities may be familiar with when they think about design guidelines, which in most cases do not provide um, an objective baseline or an objective standard. So there are some examples of design guidelines on this slide. They may include statements um, that are very typical um, uh, in, in that cities use, uh, for example, enhance the appearance and livability of the community or projects shall not require excessive grading. Um, these are useful in starting a uh, conversation about uh, projects and allowing for um, uh, framing how projects actually can be reviewed, um, but they are not objective. So why should cities and towns in Marin County have objective design standards? So first and foremost, uh, this project is trying to provide tools to jurisdictions within Marin County in order to position themselves as strongly as possible to achieve high quality design for new multifamily and mixed use buildings. And the important issue here is that uh, in particular for by right housing projects that um, have um, fall under definitions through state law, um, uh, having strong objective design standards allows jurisdictions to continue to make decisions about uh, the review um, and ensuring that those projects can be good designed and actually uh, contributing uh, to the communities. So it's important to actually um, uh, incorporate these objective design standards um, in terms of maintaining uh, strong local control over projects and making sure that good development is an outcome. Now, each jurisdiction in Marin is going to need to make individual decisions about where objective design and development standards should apply. At a minimum, uh, they should apply to sites where state streamlining requirements are in place. This might be, for example, projects, uh, sites that are subject to SB 35, um, but um, they may also apply objective design standards uh, to uh, areas, the geographical areas where uh, these kinds of projects might be allowed. And so this actually um, might apply to multifamily zone districts or commercial districts where residential isn't allowed use. Um, but we also recognize that moving forward, all of the jurisdictions will likely need to be making decisions about how and where to accommodate housing in the future. So the idea is that the template is something that could be applied uh, in, in certain terms today or in six months. And down the road, uh, there may be other aspects of it that may be applicable to uh, other um, uh, places um, in individual communities that may need to use such a tool to facilitate the um, uh, 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 infill housing in the future. So, uh, but objective design and development standards, uh, the intent is not that they are, um, would be applicable just anywhere. And for example, uh, single family zones and sites that are zoned for single family housing are excluded from the application of objective uh, design and development standards. Um, also, any projects that might require an amendment to the general plan, any community plan in place, uh, or um, um, uh, um, any zoning, uh, existing zoning regulation uh, would also not be subject to objective design development standards and a discretionary process uh, could occur uh, uh, to, uh, to, to allow those pieces to fall into place uh, before a project would be proposed 
um, and reviewed. Um, and uh, this as well would exclude any project that might result in any uh, uh, one or more significant public health and safety impacts. For example, sites that actually might be located in flood zones or other high risk areas uh, uh, within the community. And just a little bit of information about how objective design standards relate to uh, new state laws. So there's a number of laws that have actually uh, been uh, passed um, and adopted at the state level in um, recent uh, years. These include SB 35 uh, and uh, more recently the uh, Housing Streamlining Acts and SB 330, which uh, in general are trending toward uh, increased ministerial uh, or by right approvals of housing projects, as well as mixed use projects that um, present a two thirds uh, ratio of housing to ground floor non residential space. Um, in other situations, um, state law is providing or um, the, is limiting the subjective review of projects, limiting the number of public hearings and meetings that might be held. Uh, to consider um, uh, um, housing projects and is um, uh, increasing the terms around uh, projects that would be exempt otherwise from CEQA review. And so again, objective design standards are a, seen as a really important way that local jurisdictions can maintain control and uh, continue to influence and direct the design of multifamily and mixed use buildings um, that uh, otherwise might be presented as, as, as by right projects under state law. So at this point, we're going to pause uh, for some um, uh, questions and comments. And so I'm gonna pass the baton back over uh, to, uh, to Dave. Great, thank you, Stefan. And for those of you that might've dialed in before we got started, um, the hope is that we're gonna do a discussion initially with members of the Planning Commission uh, ideally using the raise hand tool that's at the bottom of your participant window. Uh, and then I'll see who has a question or comment. It can go ahead and unmute you so, so we can get started that way and not speak over each other and keep it efficient. But then we're also gonna open up for public comment. I see six to eight folks um, from the public that I believe are dialed on as well. So we'll give you each three minutes after that initial discussion. Uh, and for you as well, the same, same uh, routine is to use the raise hand um, function that's at the bottom of your participant window and or if you called in dialing star nine will let me know that you have a comment. Um, so with that, it looks like Michelle has a comment. So I'm going to go ahead and actually you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hey. So thanks very much for the uh, very succinct presentation. I really appreciate it. I think one of the things that I've been thinking about on this particular topic is that the town of Fairfax is a very unique town in terms of um, narrow roads were very much almost a historically resort type location with um, a lot of trees and historic downtown and um, the lots are not flat like you saw in these diagrams and so with re this is the question with regards to objective design standards how can you design them for um, sloped lots, um, step down lots. And then the second question has to do with public health and safety impact. I think that the example you gave was very obvious, but can you talk about some other public health and safety impacts? Could it be hydrology, geology? Could it be uh, density of person or um, you know, VMT vehicle miles number, like intensity of intersections or anything like that. What are your thoughts on those those two things? And thanks again for your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, Stefan, did you want to take a pass at that? Yeah, sure. Um, just and thank you, Michelle, for those two um, questions. I think um, you are correct <laughs> in um, thinking about Fairfax as as a very sort of unique community. And I would say that um, there definitely are particularities in each jurisdiction um, that the decision around creating objective design standards has an opportunity to address. Um, and so 
Um, when I go through the next phase of the presentation, I'm going to try to touch a little bit on the layers of things that we anticipate would be included in the template and places where individual communities can elect to craft supplemental standards that are intended to be responsive to uh, conditions that may be more unique. Um, I will say with regards to slope that, that that is something that we are analyzing when we look at the potential sites in all the jurisdictions where um, these objective design standards may apply. And so to a certain extent, we will be able to accommodate and address uh, uh, that um, to the extent that those standards can be um, um, standardized across uh, parcels. So I would expect the objective design standards to address slope on parcels to some degree. Um, the second question about public health and safety impacts. Um, the, I will say that the state laws actually provide a pretty good list within the um, bill, each bill's language uh, that describes situations where housing projects would essentially be exempt or would become conditions under which they would not be by right projects. And um, I don't have that list in front of me, but one another uh, issue that is mentioned is the presence of a high risk uh, fire zone um, in addition to um, high risk flood zones. And um, uh, there are a few other items that actually are listed. I do not believe that um, that uh, VMT uh, or traffic related impacts are listed as a potential for um, uh, shifting projects away from uh, from by right projects. Um, but it would, I would also point out that um, the um, the assumption is that all projects should be fitting within the uh, building envelope that the zoning ordinance and the general plan have actually already determined. Um, and that in situations where a project would be presented that would exceed those, uh, then it actually would become uh, a project that would be subject to discretionary review. Dave, I think you're muted. That's embarrassing. I should have figured that out by now. Thanks, Stefan, and thank you, uh, Michelle. Uh, Cindy or Esther, any thoughts you'd like to share before we open up for public comment? No? Okay. So now, as I mentioned earlier, so for members of the public, uh, if you would like to either do the raise your hand if you're online or if you're calling in, dial star nine, and that'll actually do the raise your hand feature. Or for those that are watching through the public TV channel, you're also welcome to participate by calling in and doing the star nine function. Any comments um, from participants are welcome. I am not seeing anything pop up. And just a reminder for those that might have dialed in. After we started, there will be one more session um, and availability for you to provide comments um, towards the end of the presentation. So we'll go through what oh, looks like. Michelle, do you have one more comment? I think there was a couple of other you know, thoughts. One was um, Ben approached the Planning Commission and Cindy is going to be on a sub I think it's Cindy, or maybe it's a couple of the planning commissioners going to be on a subcommittee to select a historic um, consultant to do some work that would supplement and add to what you're doing. Can you talk about how these two things kind of dovetail together, how you're seeing that? That's one thing. And then the second question that I had was, um, one of the things that we've been struggling with is what Stefan just brought up, which is that our municipal code floor area ratio and the physical 
construction size that's being built is much greater than what's existing in a neighborhood or adjacent. So more of an incremental growth. And so what I'm hearing is that these objective design standards are gonna really be based upon creating box boxes that are based upon the general plan or zoning uh, area and say within that box, you can build you know, whatever you want, as long as it's got these particular components to it, you know, here's the list. And so I guess the only way that we could be having more incremental changes in the community is either, is what? Reducing the municipal code, uh, commercial and multifamily floor area ratio and increasing setbacks and general addressing general plan density by looking at it maybe by neighborhood or a district or something like that? Or how, how do you think that might be addressed? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think a lot or some of that will probably get answered as we go through the rest of the presentation um, when we talk a little bit more about what the deliverables might look like. Um, but I'll open it up to both Stefan and maybe Ben, if, if either of you had some thoughts initially um, to that. Stefan, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I um, I can start with the, the second question. I would ask Ben to provide some input with regards to um, the historic work that the town right. is currently right. um, yeah. pursuing. But why don't I go ahead and get started with the first one, the, the, the second question. Both great questions, Michelle. Um, the, um, the, we, we see, we really see this project as, as an implementing project. And so, uh, we are looking for guidance within the jurisdictions with regards to the zoning envelope that they have already determined through, uh, policy decisions and also regulatory decisions. Um, but the objective design standards can help to provide a more predictable outcome to some of those uh, standards that might be on the ground. And I'll talk a little bit about this um, moving forward, but for example, there might be a, uh, an FAR limitation of let's say one, uh, or there might be a density limitation of 20 dwelling units to the acre. And uh, when those are applied to the broad range of parcels uh, where, um, uh, where they actually may be applicable, you may actually get a very broad range of outcomes, some of which actually might be desirable and others which the community might see as undesirable uh, because both of those will, have, will be a function of lot size. Um, and so what we can do through the objective design standards process is actually try to spend, pay more attention to the actual zoning envelope to, to as you mentioned, the box or the form of development can take when it's actually placed on an individual parcel. Um, as we do this, it, it may raise questions about the effectiveness of some of those density or FAR regulations, but the uh, objective design standards can go further in terms of defining sort of what, what might be desirable, and it can think more carefully about things, like as you mentioned, like context, um, how to best, better, best relate uh, buildings to adjacent uh, sites that actually may be smaller in scale, um, things of that nature. This might involve decisions to place upper floors under roof forms or step back uh, um, upper levels so that a three-story building might be compatible with an adjacent two-story building, for example. Um, so we will have a chance to consider many of those things um, um, in detail. Um, and then I just want to mention that um, we are in a situation where uh, the Housing Streamlining Acts that were adopted uh, in 2018 and 2019 have set limitations on jurisdictions' abilities to downzone or change standards that reduce the envelope uh, beyond which had been established on a certain date. Um, and so um, the solutions to increase setbacks or reduce it or reduce density would be difficult to consider um, at this point, um, considering the provisions of SB 330. And then if I can shift over to Ben, then maybe you can talk a little bit about the, um, the historic work that the, the town is pursuing. 
Yes, thank you, Stefan. Um, great remarks, uh, including the cautionary aspect of what state legislation has already done in terms of uh, curtailing any jurisdiction's ability to reduce what we currently have on the books. However, the good news is number one, we're participating in this collaborative effort with uh, other like-minded jurisdictions in Marin. Um, and I think uh, Michelle, uh, our chair, Rodriguez, excuse me, uh, you will see as we go through these slides, um, just the type of details that are so important in determining within a given uh, envelope and height limit, et cetera, um, how we can be very specific with these objective standards uh, in terms of uh, letting developers know through this, uh, de through the community developing these tools and these standards, what the town expects and wants and will insist on. Um, another aspect is the historic work. We're uh, in the process of selecting historic consultant now. Um, once we get that person on board, their specific focus will be on the downtown historic area and they will be looking at uh, characteristics, uh, sort of iconic structures, um, things of that nature. So uh, basically elements that reflect the, the history and the current developed environment of Fairfax. And this will segue into the subjective des design and development standards effort. Um, so we will be look at taking a very careful look at what Fairfax has and part of the historic character um, that makes this town unique and providing that input into this project and it will be reflected in the final design standards we develop. Great, thank you, Ben. I believe uh, Commissioner Gonzalez Parber had a comment or question. You're now unmuted or you should be soon. Are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, am I unmuted? Can you hear me now? No, you're good, yeah. Okay. Okay, I just, um, I guess I just uh, have a point of clarification. Um, you know, this has been discussed, I, I think, in terms of, uh, the, you know, the California mandate uh, to allow uh, the growth, the housing growth through accessory dwelling units and how, um, you know, the mandate doesn't really address the specific needs uh, or topography of the individual town. So I just want to make sure that I understand uh, when you say that these uh, standards don't apply to uh, single family structures, uh, that is not to say that once you have an accessory dwelling unit, it triggers these objective standards, correct? I don't know if, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is as soon as somebody applies for an accessory dwelling unit, is that considered, in your view, a, a multi, multi family? That, that's, that's a very good question. The ADUs are sort of living a separate bucket that from the, um, the, 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 the bevy of state laws that are pushing objective design standards for multifamily housing. It, it, it sort of ADUs are not considered under that definition is multifamily housing. Um, there, other jurisdictions have expressed uh, a desire and a uh, some concern and a, a desire to make sure that there are good objective standards for ADUs. Um, and in fact, some jurisdictions in Marin really leverage ADUs and, or second units on residential lots in order to meet their uh, the arena numbers. Um, so um, it's very uh, possible that this project will have an opportunity to look at creating objective standards for ADUs. Um, but the, 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 the bevy of state laws that are sort of pushing for streamlining are really focused on multifamily housing and mixed use residential, non-residential bu uh, uh, buildings um, uh, and, and the need for objective design standards around those. If, if I might interject briefly, uh, it, Fairfax is also collaborating with a number of other marine jurisdictions um, separate from this objective design process, um, but in working on ADU 
uh, furthering ADU regulations. And some of that uh, could well include some design standards and eventually a workbook product. So, um, you know, key, uh, building off Stefan's remarks, I think Fairfax will in the future have uh, more comprehensive ADU regulations. Great, thank you, Ben. It looks like Commissioner Swift has a comment or question. Okay, so along the lines of Esther's question regarding ADUs, we have um, single family zoning in Fairfax, but how does this apply to a duplex that may be in a single family zone? It sounds like it would be similar to the approach to ADUs or no? Uh, to Mr. Swift, I think that's probably one of those uh, detailed questions that uh, we could probably report out to your commission um, at the upcoming uh, June planning commission meeting. So this is part of what we will be doing tonight in addition to recording this meeting um, is taking some of the more in-depth questions and, uh, and uh, doing some research and coming back with you. But the duplex question is, is, a, is a good one. Great, thank you all. So with that, we have the exciting part of the presentation left where we're gonna get a little bit more into what the analysis looks like and what the potential deliverable can be. Um, and I didn't see any other comments from the public, so we're gonna go ahead and power forward here. So Stefan, back to you, let's get you going here. Oh, we didn't need that, let's move on. There we go. Thank you. Um, thank you, to, uh, David, and I appreciate everyone's uh, questions so far. So I'm going to talk, uh, start by talking a little bit about phases one and two of this three-phase project. And as I mentioned, uh, some of this work is underway, um, uh, uh, working closely with uh, the, the, the planning directors um, in the different jurisdictions. So I'm going to touch on an existing conditions analysis uh, that we pr uh, prepared. Um, uh, I will talk a little bit about the countywide survey uh, which is uh, still open and available um, uh, to take. And then I will talk about the most recent uh, deliverable um, uh, for the jurisdictions, the place types and building types atlas, and then some uh, ongoing work that uh, some of the jurisdictions have elected to do uh, to supplement the process. Um, and um, that includes uh, some more detailed analysis of particular locations in some of the communities, uh, as well as some um, site testing uh, of sites that are seen as being important um, for, um, uh, for multifamily development. So starting with the existing conditions analysis, we asked each jurisdiction to provide for us uh, um, sites that in their community uh, that um, where they felt that objective design standards might be applicable. Um, these might be uh, sites uh, that are subject to SB 35 in some cases. They, uh, in most cases, were sites that um, the communities had listed on previous housing elements or their current housing element um, as uh, uh, being appropriate for, uh, uh, for, for infill housing. And uh, when we looked at uh, those parcels, we received information, and um, I'm probably going to get this number wrong, I think it's 763 individual parcels um, across the county uh, were submitted um, by the, the participating jurisdictions. And uh, we looked at categorizing uh, those uh, sites into initial buckets as a way to uh, start to understand uh, what the different um, qualities that we needed to analyze would be. So we looked at their location within communities, whether they were in edge condition, um, a suburban condition, or that they existed in the sort of the cores of communities, whether in some of the traditional downtowns that many of you are familiar with. Uh, we looked at whether the um, sites were um, along uh, corridors or within neighborhoods. Uh, we looked at the top topographical conditions of these sites, uh, their uh, lot sizes, whether they were sort of small, medium, large, or outliers. And we also looked at their adjacencies, uh, whether they were within multifamily areas, whether they were adjacent to commercial zones, et cetera. Uh, and we looked at some information with regards to constraints. This was helpful for us because it helped us start to put 
the sites that are in existing jurisdictions into um, some preliminary buckets. And it helped us to start to understand what characteristics a community like Fairfax might have that might be shared across other jurisdictions. Uh, again, thinking about where opportunities to apply a template uh, might be appropriate. And uh, this work uh, was done in parallel with the release of a survey. And um, the survey is actually available um, on uh, the county's website. Um, this has been open for, uh, I believe, about 30 days, and we've received some uh, pretty good responses uh, so far. Um, the survey does appear to be working as, um, uh, uh, as designed, and uh, some jurisdictions in the county elected to um, include uh, supplemental questions that were specific to their jurisdiction. Um, the goal here for us was really to establish an understanding around perspectives and readiness for multifamily infill development. And we also want to try to understand and help to identify key challenges and opportunities that might be addressed. And so we're thinking about this somewhat differently than a visual preference survey. And we're thinking about it largely about sort of uh, to help inform, um, uh, help inform what components of the, uh, of the objective design standards we should focus on down the road um, but also uh, how folks feel about this and how ready they might be in individual communities. Uh, and we hope that both, of the, both sets of these information is sort of useful for us as we shift later on in the process to applying uh, the template locally um, uh, in, in different jurisdictions. So the, uh, the next uh, piece that um, has been uh, prepared uh, for the plan directors is the place types and building types atlas. And what this atlas seeks to do is to dial in a little bit further uh, uh, in detail uh, to what the existing conditions analysis was able to prepare and to really start to identify the characteristics that define different environments in Marin County that are shared across jurisdictions. And the idea here is to start to sort of geographically demonstrate opportunities for where pieces of the anticipated um, objective design standards template uh, might be applicable uh, across different jurisdictions. And if you go to the next slide, um, this um, next slide sort of describes, it starts to, to introduce how this information is actually presented. Um, um, we, we took those in the buckets of the existing uh, conditions analysis. We dialed into a further level of detail and uh, defined a set of place types that exist across communities uh, from uh, uh, very rural conditions uh, to the most urban conditions that we see in the cores and traditional downtowns. And we cross-reference this against where we anticipated, um, uh, where uh, communities have told us that they think objective design standards might be applicable. And so um, these environments range from um, uh, uh, commercial and mixed-use environments at cores, to areas where um, different scales and intensities of multifamily neighborhoods uh, might be expected, uh, to mixed environments where uh, neighborhoods might be made up of both single family houses and multifamily housing, um, um, as well as other places um, in the county that may not have clear policy direction, uh, but could uh, today, but could uh, fit into uh, one of the other categories that's been defined. Um, this information right now is uh, in the process of being finalized, and we anticipate that this will be very useful, again, as we shift to having a conversation about how and where the template can be applicable. The template also provides information about building types and looking for opportunities for patterns uh, that can be applied, again, across jurisdictions. And key to this is this aspect of missing middle housing and that there are a range of multifamily prototypes, particularly in Marin jurisdictions that are of a lesser intensity 
than what we might see in more urban areas uh, in the Bay Area. Um, and in, in many cases, these are multifamily prototypes that share a form and character and scale with uh, traditional single family fabric. So we want to understand how we can create standards that might be appropriate for duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes, very small apartments, bungalow courts, um, other multifamily prototypes that can either be placed within these mixed single and multifamily environments or uh, uh, be used to sort of uh, create um, transition areas that are adjacent uh, to single family environments and can overcome some of these issues um, around neighborhood compatibility that might otherwise arise. So um, those are that's sort of a summary of the sort of the pieces of phases one and two. And in phase three, we're going to take a lot of that content and we're going to, we anticipate developing objective design standards that are organized into a range of zone districts that can actually accommodate or are applicable to a, the, the range of rural to urban environments that you see um, in the county and the different jurisdictions. And the idea is that uh, the jurisdictions can pick and choose from that template to apply to the environments that actually might be applicable for them. So there might be sort of a downtown zone, for example, that is applicable to a couple of jurisdictions. There might be something that's applicable to cores that also might be applicable to a few other jurisdictions. So the intent is not to sort of create a one size fits all template, but to create a menu that the different jurisdictions can pick and choose from to meet uh, the, 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 the conditions that they, that, that, that they might have. We also anticipate that um, the template will need to address how communities are reviewing and administrating, re administering review around these kinds of projects. And so we'll provide, the template will include some information about um, review procedures, admin and review procedures for uh, where these bio rate standards might be applicable. As I suggested before, and this is an important component, jurisdictions will make a choice about how they actually want to apply the template. And in some situations, you can imagine that if this is only applicable to buy right projects, it might be applied as an overlay zone where it only is triggered if certain kinds of projects are proposed. We know that some jurisdictions are interested in this approach. We know that other jurisdictions are thinking about this as a tool to help meet their arena requirements, whether existing or future. And they might be thinking about this as a more wholesale change to the zoning, to applying a rezone and, uh, and introducing these objective design standard zones to replace existing multifamily or mixed use zoning that they might have on the books. Um, there's a second component to this that's very important, which is information about architectural patterns. And we uh, want to, uh, the, the template anticipate will include standards that be applied to provide additional detail around um, architectural treatments. And uh, in some situations, Fairfax included, uh, there's an opportunity to do a further layer of documentation that can provide additional information about architectural style and really sort of dial in, try to dial in sort of con questions about context sensitivity and the introduction of new buildings into what might be considered a historic context, for example. And we'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. Once that information goes into the, uh, to the jurisdictions, we anticipate that there will be a more detailed discussion around the local application of, of those standards. And so at that point, uh, during uh, phase three in the fall, uh, many of the jurisdictions have uh, designed and created a community engagement plan and are anticipating additional public meetings and work with for around additional public hearings that would um, facilitate a more public discussion about how the template might be applied locally. And these next pages are to sort of provide sort of introductory example of what we can anticipate when we think about objective design standards. 
we anticipate that the template will actually provide standards that uh, are uh, provide uh, that are that are described in a sort of a very clear set of tables and accompanying diagrams uh, that describe uh, how buildings might be placed on lots, um, their frontage conditions, their height conditions, the form and character of individual buildings, for example. We also anticipate that they will provide supplemental standards for things like building types, um, uh, particular conditions like uh, sloped lots, for example, or uh, other conditions that might need to be addressed like adjacency, um, adjacency conditions to family homes or um, adjacencies to um, historic properties, for example. Um, we anticipate that all of those things will be addressed in the template. Um, the template will also include information about architectural standards that will provide an additional layer of information with regards to building massing, uh, facade composition, uh, the nature around openings and exterior elements. Um, and, uh, and we do anticipate, for example, in Fairfax, that additional information will be included that addresses different architectural styles and treatments uh, that would ensure that buildings would be reflective of particular conditions within the community. So in closing, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, an example in Marin where objective design standards have been applied. Um, this is a case study from the community of Novato. Uh, this work was uh, done uh, in the last few years and is, 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 is waiting for adoption uh, upon uh, completion of the uh, ongoing general plan update, um, which is anticipated to be completed later this year. Um, the Northwest neighborhood is a mixed single family and multifamily neighborhood that's adjacent to downtown Novato. Uh, it's about 50 acres in size. Um, there was a significant sort of policy regulatory conflict that needed to be overcome, which was uh, the reasoning around um, creating uh, this new zone district to um, apply to this neighborhood. And that the general plan allowed um, medium density resident fill of up to 20 dwelling units to the acre, uh, but the zoning had a legacy standard that limited infill of, uh, of only 10 dwelling units to the acre. So the idea was to bring zoning forward that would enable the general plan policy direction for 20 dwelling units to the acre in a form and character that would be uh, accepted by the community. Um, and so the attention to objective design standards that paid attention to the form and character of buildings to sort of try to resolve uh, some of those issues. So if you go to the next slide, a little bit additional context is that the quandary was that many, many sites within the community already exceeded the 20 dwelling uh, to the acre max that was set in the general plan. Um, but the, 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 the standards were created as a response to really bad infill buildings um, that uh, really started to um, um, uh, 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 change the character of the neighborhood uh, starting um, in the 1960s and the 1970s. And um, these buildings were um, uh, more so a, a result of the sort of the application of sort of bad standards that didn't have an opportunity to reflect some of these local context issues. And so one of the primary, primary goals of the objective design standards were to, again, try to meet the general plan density um, requirements, but to do that in uh, buildings that would share form and scale with the existing single family fabric um, that existed in the neighborhood. And this was done through the definition of a zoning envelope that trended toward uh, things that you see in the example on the right here. Um, this is a fourplex um, that, um, that organizes four units in one building um, that but shares a similar width and height to single family homes in the neighborhood as opposed to uh, what you see on the left of one of these legacy examples. So in order to do that in Novato, we needed to sort of analyze what was on the ground today and also uh, what the existing zoning envelope allowed. And I think this is sort of an example of what objective design standards can do 
um, this and the zone uh, today were allowed to be up to 35 feet in height um, and three stories, but the way that that information was presented was really ambiguous. And so that means that uh, buildings such as the sort of tuck under townhouse example on the left were uh, completely possible under um, existing zoning, even though they might greatly um, be, um, be much larger um, uh, than uh, what we might see on adjacent parcels. So um, the objective design standards in this case in the Novato zone actually present a building height of two and a half stories, which re require that third floor to be under uh, a roof form. Um, and this uh, additional sort of prescription is intended to create a more compatible building uh, with um, what we might see um, uh, on adjacent parcels. The objective design standards also pay very particular attention to supplemental standards uh, such as fronted and where parking can be allowed. And um, this example on the left both shows that the parking as a primary feature to the front yard um, is not addressed um, um, in, in the, um, under the existing standards. And the building um, also can present a blank wall to the street and both of those things were um, seek to be overcome in uh, the, the new objective design standards. So there are particular guidance with regards to frontage uh, and frontage type and in terms of um, the how our entrances can be articulated and uh, how they might be fronting of the street. Um, and also with regards to where parking can be placed um, on the lot to ensure that uh, facades aren't dominated uh, by garages or carports. And the next slide sort of provides an example. Oh, I'm sorry, it's actually, um, I, I misspoke. Um, the objective design standards have opportunity to address um, both those sort of the base zone envelope as well as sort of those supplemental pieces um, like uh, frontage and parking location, which I uh, mentioned. So circling back now to the schedule, as I mentioned, we're sort of in the middle of phase two. The place and building types atlas has been completed and reviewed with the plan directors. And we are working with many of the uh, existing jurisdictions uh, to uh, perform uh, site testing on uh, uh, sites that um, uh, um, they believe would um, be appropriate to create additional analysis to inform the objective design standards. Um, that is um, not a task that we are doing in the town of Fairfax, um, but Fairfax has elected for us to prepare some additional uh, architectural documentation that can follow up on the historic analysis that, um, that, the, um, that uh, will be done beforehand. Um, so this information will be input um, into the template shared with the planning director starting in the fall. And then we anticipate a more detailed discussion with individual communities as they work to apply portions of the, uh, the, the, uh, the template that may be applicable uh, to the individual conditions um, in their respective communities. So that concludes the second um, uh, 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 piece of the presentation this evening. And I will turn it back over uh, to Dave to facilitate questions and comments. Thank you very much, Stefan. I believe if I'm not mistaken, we have Commissioner Newton on with us now as well. Um, and if so, I'm gonna request that you turn your video on if you can. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it looks like we have a question or comment from Commissioner Swift. I had a couple of questions, one on the process um, and one on the survey. So as far as the process, it seems that the planning staff and you all have been doing a lot of work, that there's been an existing conditions analysis and key findings for our community. Um, the planning director has provided you all a number of sites as as examples. So my question on the on the on the process is 
we haven't seen any of that um, so far. So is the expectation that the community won't see any of the work that's been done until phase three, when there's review of a toolkit that's already kind of drafted? So that's my first question. Um, and I'll wait on that for my second question. Thank you, Commissioner Swift. I'm going to ask both uh, Stefan and maybe Ben to help answer that question. You both should be able to unmute yourselves. Okay. Um, I could start, um, and then um, maybe Ben can uh, sort of follow up. So um, the the work that we are doing with the planning directors, uh, they have been the primary guide for that work. Um, different jurisdictions have made different choices about the degree to which they want to involve um, uh, stakeholders or the public through the first um, elements of this process. So for example, we are working in parallel with a steering committee um, that is conducting public meetings around this content. Um, the, um, we, I will say that we are working to ensure that this is an implementing project and not a visioning project, and that um, we are being careful to analyze information and content that is already part of existing policy and regulation. Um, and um, we anticipate that it, where there are questions around um, items, will, it will really be important for the public to provide input on um, uh, the strategy which the, something like the template would be applied um, and the extent to which it would be applied and also the extent to which it needs to be modified in order to make that application, local application make sense. Um, so um, I will sort of include there and then ask Ben if he wants to add anything. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Uh, in terms of where staff has been um, in discussions with uh, other stakeholders, uh, as Commissioner Swift is aware, this uh, process has been discussed several times with the Planning Commission. In the course of those discussions, uh, it, it seemed as though that the direction was to uh, emphasize the historical character. Um, and that's why uh, we are going in that direction um, with the hiring of the historic consultant and the look at um, the historic elements um, that comprise our downtown area um, and our corridors along Sir Francis Drake and Broadway. Uh, in terms of other other uh, locations that were selected, um, some of those were pre-selected. They're listed in our housing element um, as receiver sites. And so those are obvious nominees uh, for this process. Um, and as Commissioner Swift is aware, there's a number of those. Um, in, in terms of when this loops around, uh, we will, the historic analysis will be operating in parallel with the work that uh, uh, Opticos uh, is doing. And so the idea is as we get more information about which specific historic features, um, maybe iconoclastic uh, locations, um, I can say that the Alpine building at the corner of Broadway and Bolinas was listed as a building. Um, that's obviously one of the signature structures in town and it's a historic structure, of course, in its own right. So um, hopefully that helps answer that question. Okay, and thank you. And then my second question relates to the survey. Do you have a sense of how many, because on the survey, takers will identify what community they're from? So do you have a sense of how many Fairfax residents have taken the survey to date and how long the survey will remain open? Stefan, do you want me to take a crack at that? 
<laughs> yeah, well, um, the, I, I, I don't have information available right now on the number of respondents from the town, um, but that information is available. We can get that to you as a follow-up. Um, uh, I am looking here. Um, the most recent information I have on that on that uptake is um, uh, over two weeks ago, and there were uh, at that time there were about two hundred and fifty responses. Um, and so, and I I don't I can we can definitely get some additional information on uh, for you on that. Um, and then um, I believe that the goal is to try to leave this open um, until the end of June. Is that correct? End of June, yeah. End of June, yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah, we extended it out to allow more folks to, to plug in. So the 250 approximately were just Fairfax respondents, right? Or overall? No, I can tell you the data I have is that as of May 11th, I'm, I'm sorry that that's the most recent data I'm sorry. I have. Yeah, as of May 11th, there were 288 responses to the survey uh, in the county. Got it. County so, and those numbers have continued to increase um, in the last uh, two weeks. And if I might uh, jump in here um, to note that links to those um, have been posted on the town's website. Uh, if you go to the first page of the town website and click down or scroll down to news and you will see uh, a header that talks about objective design and development standards um, that will take you to the survey link um, as commissioner swift is also aware staff has been repeatedly um, mentioning the availability of that survey um, at the planning commission meetings several planning commission meetings uh, and we continue to do so we hope that every person who uh, is listening in on this broadcast um, or may watch the recording of this. I understand we are, we are double booked tonight. That was unfortunate. But if you are, uh, we want to hear from you what your response is to those survey questions. It's very important. As um, our team has indicated tonight, this will provide important information about local residents' preferences uh, for the future objective design and development standards. So. It's still open, it will continue to be open and uh, get online and uh, make your comment and do provide yourself with a little bit of time. It's it's fairly in depth. So I would say, I don't know, Commissioner Swift, would, what would you guess, uh, half an hour? You're going, people are going to look at the presentation first, probably, and then take the survey. So it would be, longer than a half hour but okay. well worth it yeah pre i appreciate that commissioners so thanks for the plug thanks for the oh, plug appreciate that. So, uh, chair rodriguez how did you have a comment tony yeah i had a little information on the number of respondents from Great. fairfax so um as of the week of uh, the may 4th week uh, and we'll get more updated numbers as of that week uh, the the uh, respondents from Fairfax were seven, um, and uh, the most were from Mill Valley, and the second most were from Corte Madera and then Sausalito. Great, thank you for that, Tony. Yeah, again, more reason to keep it open and uh, and continue to share the word. And anything you all can do to help us spread the word would be greatly appreciated as well. Um, Chair Rodriguez, you were next. I was um, curious first about the existing conditions analysis and the building place types and analysis. Um, any reflection that you have on how those might be, what were your findings regarding Fairfax? That's kind of one of, one of my questions. Another is, where are those existing conditions analysis and building place type atlases located because they're not on this, the town website they're not on the county website so where where can we see them that's that's one question and maybe i'll wait unless you want me to give you the others all at once uh maybe we could answer that question for you and then we'll get to the second question if that's okay stefan did you want to take that um 
the first question was about any reflection on what we learned from Fairfax with regards to the existing conditions memo or the work that we did in the place types atlas. Um, and uh, I will, Tony, I don't know if you want to add anything, but my, um, my, my reaction is that there are, um, from the standpoint of uh, sort of lot prototypes, lot sizes, setback conditions, um, we do see some commonality um, in uh, particularly in sort of the core of Fairfax that we see in our communities. Um, and um, Fairfax is a sort of an interesting place because it's sort of in the middle on the spectrum. It's not the most, it doesn't represent sort of the most rural conditions in the county. And it certainly doesn't represent sort of the other end of the spectrum that you might see in a place like San Rafael. Um, but it is, um, we, I think we do see some sort of shared um, characteristics. Um, and um, Tony, I don't know if you sort of want to add anything to that sort of at this point, based on what we found from those two documents. No, I think that that summarizes it well. And then um, with regards to where, <laughs> where these documents are, um, I, I'm not the best person to, to answer that question. <laughs> so um, um, I don't know if anybody else can, can chime in on um, how those are intended to be made available. Yeah, I don't know if, if Ben, if you want to respond to that, but I know that initially I, the, the goal with those analyses were meant just as that as kind of foundational analyses that will then feed into the final product of, of the uh, objective design standards. And at that point, it'll kind of holistically, I think be a package just delivered for, for everyone's view. Initially, it was, it was meant to get feedback from planning directors um, to fine tune as we move through the process. So it wasn't really meant to be posted on the website or shared in any way. Um, so that, that was the initial intent there. Ben, did you have anything to add to that? Well, just to uh, comment that one of our challenges uh, is that we have many things on our plate um, at this time, uh, not the least of which is uh, things that we were hoping to do in early March uh, via in-person workshops uh, had to be uh, rescheduled, is right. the word. Um, and then it went to a video, which is also on the town website. Um, so I think we're, we're dealing with a somewhat uh, truncated uh, situation. Um, and second, as you indicated, Dave, that was my understanding also, is this is foundational information. Um, it was more, uh, I think the, my input um, was more just looking at editing um, and corrections, um, because as you know, um, these are com common analyses across jurisdictions. Um, part of what we're learning, we're all learning, and I'm delighted to see uh, this presentation going out to the public tonight is the language of uh, design and development standards because this is a very specific detailed work that uh, frankly it takes experts such as the design team uh, that has been selected uh, to really get into the nuts and bolts of. Um, I would also further state that <laughs> Uh, the historic analysis is where we think that we will be bringing a lot of what we hope to see in our downtown area into this, uh, this work. Great. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for that question, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, any other comments or questions uh, from commissioners? And Commissioner Newton, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for your reference, we're using the raise hand tool. It's at the bottom of the participant window. Uh, if you had any questions or comments at this time. Um, I'm seeing none. So we're gonna go ahead now and open it up for uh, the participants of general public that have dialed or, or logged in. Um, same, same for you all is to go ahead and click that raise your hand feature uh, on the participant window and or dial nine if you called in and we can call on you now and give you three minutes to respond. 
I don't see anything popping up. Uh, and just one note that I know that was a bit of trouble getting onto this earlier. My team has done a bunch of research and found that Zoom has over the last few days apparently changed their protocol and are now mandating any meeting to have a log or a password. Um, if you don't have a Zoom account, you have to have a password now. So word to the wise. Um, that's why folks that were able to get on were able to get on through their Zoom account. Otherwise, um, every meeting has to have a password, probably part of their attempt to reduce Zoom bombing and, and all those other fun things that have been happening out there. So apologize for that. But as Ben mentioned, and we mentioned earlier, this is being recorded and will be posted to um, the town's website uh, as a resource. And, uh, and I just wanted to thank you all so much for spending this very warm evening with us. Um, we very much appreciate it and just wanted to reiterate that there is a project website um, that is through the county's website, but is also posted, oh, excuse me, didn't mean to do that, uh, is also on the, uh, the town's website, all links back to the county's website where all the resources, fact sheets, um, any information that is recently available is will be posted to that website as well. So we definitely uh, sure that um, you should definitely go there to get more information as it becomes available and or email Ben with any questions that might pop up. Um, and with that, oh, looks like Cindy had a question or comment. Yeah, just one quick question. The survey was, um, who was responsible for the survey itself? Was that Opticus? That was, it was, an, it was a very much a team effort. Uh, Lisa Wise Consultants took the lead on actually putting it together, but it was a complete team effort between the Opticos team, all the planning directors weighed in um, and planned a place. We all kind of came together to put that together. So it was a collective effort. Was that, that answer your question, Commissioner Swift? It did. I did have some feedback on it and um, wasn't sure where to direct that. Uh, the best would probably be through Ben, um, All right. and he could definitely get that to us, and and we'll we'll definitely up for any feedback that you have. We appreciate that. All right, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Any closing thoughts, words of wisdom as we wrap this up? Excuse me, got the mute off. Um, yes, one of the things uh, I want to emphasize is that there will. This is just the first um, of. Uh, several meetings that are scheduled are, are planned. We don't have a schedule yet, uh, but I think, you know, one of the concerns is always, how do we get the word out? How do we make sure that the public is fully appraised um, and have an opportunity to comment? Um, I'm uh, disappointed to hear that Zoom has added a layer of challenge, but I think we all know that uh, as we go into this virtual world, there have been any number of, of problems um, trying to go to a virtual platform and thus far with Fairfax it seems like it's been pretty good. Um, we the, the town will continue uh, to uh, hone its ability to solicit public input. Um, I intend to continue to have this as a planning commission agenda item going through the summer. Um, so in addition to specific uh, workshops, um, updates, etc. Um, there will be multiple opportunities uh, to uh, provide information. Um, this first phase is very much just informational and outreach. And so nothing's been decided. Um, everybody uh, planning, the planning department, uh, our design team, et cetera, our goal is to end up with uh, uh, standards that are reflective uh, of Fairfax and accepted by the community. Great point. Thank you so much for that, Ben. Uh, unless there's any other comments or questions, I think we'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting. So I want to. Yeah. Oh, I, I just want to jump in here. I'm not sure if uh, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez is here. Um, let me just check at my list. Uh, I don't. Let me just take another look here. Because the only reason I'm saying that is if there is a meeting, uh, if, if we do have a, no, we don't have a quorum. Okay, so if we had a quorum, it would be appropriate for the chair to uh, formally declare the meeting as adjourned before we 
stop the pain. But we're back down to three commissioners. Sure. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and adjourn then. I, do we have four? Chair Rodriguez, is that what you meant? I think we had four, but one dropped back off. So we ended up back with three. Oh, okay. Cindy, Michelle, Mimi. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm happy to let you adjourn just to make sure we're safe. There you go. <laughs> Would you like to do the official adjournment, Chair Rodriguez? I'm, I'm seeing no. Okay, <laughs> there you go. All right, then I think we are uh, officially done with this meeting. I wanna thank you all again and please stay tuned and we'll be back in touch with more opportunities to engage with the process. Thank you so much. Have a thank great you. day.